got this. A hug might be a good. You got this. Come on! You got this! You got this. Dear Jesus. I want to invite you into my heart. You got this. I want you to know today that our Heavenly Father uh, is the greatest example of encouragement that there is. And he's telling each and every one of us today, you got this. Would you look at your neighbor right now and just say, you got this. You got this. Yeah, you got this. You know, you're starting a new job. You got this. You know, you got some exams this week, guys. You got this. You know, you got to go to the doctor. You're not sure what the uh, result's going to be. You got this. You know why you got this? Because God's got you. That's why you got this. I'll tell you what, Vinny Baza, don't you worry. You got this. You're going to get through this cancer. You know why? Because God's got you. Amen. Amen. You got this. You got this. Amen. Anthony, Nicole, don't worry. You guys are going to Rio de Janeiro. You know why? Because you got this. Because God's got you. Amen? And he's got Keturah. Amen? So you got this. Maybe you're concerned about where your marriage is going right now, husbands. Guess what? You got this. Because God's got you. Trust him. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't run away. Stay there. Stay in that place. Press in. Because God... Good job, Ricky. <laughs> because God has got you. You see, if, if there weren't big arms that were ready to catch me, I couldn't have someone say, you got this. But in the beginning, there were big arms that I saw that were there to catch me in case I needed it until, until God built a confidence in me and says, you got this. You got this. As we change that slide this morning, we're going to be looking in, uh, uh, actually, it's Isaiah 43. My apologies. Isaiah 43, if you want to turn to that today. Isaiah 43. And we're going to take a look at the fact that God tells each and every one of us, as our Father in heaven, you got this. Now, we've been talking about being a servant, and we've been going through a, a series on, on how to serve. And as I say, it's not been a series that says how, how we should serve. It's a series to say, Lord, how am I enabled to serve? And some people say, well, you should be giving. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. All the you should be's in the world don't help me when I don't know how to do it. How about you? All the, all the mandates in the world uh, can seem impossible if I don't know how to do it. And becoming a servant is one of the hardest things that, that, that's there because guess what? We have all kinds of obstacles, and many times we don't have anyone to help us get through those obstacles. And this series has been about the heart of the servant, how to serve without growing cold, how to get a servant's heart and maintain a servant's heart. And dads, the first and foremost that we are, although we are the heads of our household, we are first and foremost servants of our households. How many people know that? And in the same way, God has served us. He created us and he served us unto salvation, amen? The reason that God can say to us, you got this, is because he did it all. He did all. I want you to see this. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. He formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name, and you are mine. 
What an incredible verse that God uh, shares, uh, this word that he shares for his people, Israel, as they're going to be going into a time of exile and, and discipline. But he wants them to know that no matter what they go through, he's going to see them through. Amen? And he lets them know, first and foremost, he did it all. He's got it all. Look what it says here. First of all, it says the Lord, what's that word? Created you. Everyone say created he created you. That's that whole connotation of making something out of nothing. How many people know God created the world? You know how he did it? He just said it. Isn't that amazing? God just spoke it and the world became into existence. And then God did something else. He, he took the dirt of the ground and, and he breathed, it says, his nostrils, his ruach, his Holy Spirit, into that, that dirt in the ground. And that dirt became a soulish being and he created mankind. The very life breath of God was breathed into Adam and continues on in you and in me. How many generations since Adam? You know, that was some breath that God breathed in him. Amen? Wow. Talk about your aftershave getting there years before you do and years after you leave, huh? Wow. You see, it says, he, he says, I formed you, what's it say? Oh, Jacob. Now, notice what happens. Is, anyone remember who Jacob was? Jacob means supplanter or deceiver, doesn't it? You see, he created Jacob. He created every person here on this earth. He, he's our creator God. He loves us, and, and he put us on this earth. And, and, and I understand any person who lives on this earth is one of God's children. He created them. And because he created them, he loves them. Because God created you, he loves you. Do you believe that today? But he goes on the next step, and he says this, And he who formed you, O Israel. Now, this is really cool how many people know what Jacob's name was changed to? Israel. Now, God said, you were called Jacob, deceiver, but now I'm going to call you Israel, one who overcomes with God. See, Jacob had learned in his life through good and through bad and through God's guidance for him that, that he could trust in God. And when he trusted in God, he could be a prince. Isn't that cool? You see, because God says, not only did I create you, but understand, he says, I formed you. Now, that word formed you is, is a really neat word, that word formed. It it's, it's means to squeeze into shape, like a potter would squeeze pottery into shape. Now, I want you to think about that. God created us as his children, but because of sin, he's had to form us or conform us to his image. See, that's what he did with Jacob. Through the good and through the bad, he not only created Jacob, but he redeemed Jacob. He, he conformed to do his image, and he called him Israel, one who overcomes with God. You see, we, we were created in the image of God. There's no doubt about it. We're fallen beings. But to each and every one of us, God continues to press through, saying a fallen creation is not good enough for me. I have better for them, and I'm not going to stop until I have molded them into what I originally intended. I want you to know that your heavenly father has a commitment to you. You got this. Because he's got you. Amen? He goes on to say this. Fear not. How many people need to hear that? I remember as a little kid, my aunt and uncle had a pool. And we would go on the weekends and we'd swim all weekend at my aunt and uncle's house. And I'll never forget my, my uncle in the pool saying, go ahead, jump. Go ahead, jump. And he put his arms, come on, jump, I got you. And then I remember jumping. And he would sort of catch me and let me go down underneath. And he pulled me up real quick. See, he had me. Therefore, I got it. You got it. Amen? You got it. Because your heavenly father, he says, fear not. You know why? Because I have redeemed you. Not I will redeem you. I have redeemed you. How many people know that you are redeemed? Today, we are the redeemed of the Lord. Amen? Not only did he create us, but to those who are in the sanctuary today who, who know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he has formed us. He has conformed us to his image. And he says, I've redeemed you. No worries. If God was powerful enough to redeem us from the ravages of sin, is he not powerful enough to take care of our finances? If God was powerful enough to, to take us away from the curse of the enemy, is he not powerful enough to get us through a relationship issue? God He's got us, and because he's got us, we got it. I've called you by name. I love what the next thing says. I, I called you by name. This is really cool. I've called you by name. Now, he just didn't say, oh, Jacob. No, no, he gave him a new name. He said, oh, Israel. And that's what Jacob began to respond to. You see, Scripture says 
that for you and for me, when we get to heaven, how many people know you're going to have a new name? Right? Remember that song? Oh, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, and it's mine. Remember that? That was a great song, wasn't it? Yeah. Understand that God has a new name for you and for me. You see, it's, it's not the earthly name of the earthly label, the earthly person we were, but it's the true character that he created in each one of us. That's a name that's going to be tailor-made to your redemption. And you know what's going to be so cool? Is that as the Spirit of God is in you, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, you're going to know who you are when he calls your name. I don't think it's going to be Matt, although Matt does mean gift of God, right? I mean, <laughs> my wife disagrees sometimes, but, <laughs> right? Yeah. You see, he's going to give us a new name. You see, the God who created us is the God who formed us, is the God who redeemed us, is the God who says, I know you by name. I've renamed you. And look at this. You are mine. What do we have to worry about? Is someone going to try to steal something out of God's hands? Don't we worry about that sometimes? You see, the reason we got it is because God's got us. And he tells us from the very beginning, he did it all to the very end. From before you were ever born or thought of by mankind until the end of time, God has a plan for your life. He's created you. He's redeemed you. He's formed you into his image. He's given you a new identity in Christ. Will you walk in that today, the confidence of that today? God says, you got it. You've seen Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. Isn't that really cool? He chose his people through Abraham. When we hear the chosen, understand what he's talking about. As those of us who have the faith of Abraham, the one he chose, we have the same faith as him. We're chosen like Abraham when we respond to Jesus Christ in that faith. Amen? In like faith. Now, this is really cool. A special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. That's how God felt about Israel, and that's how God feels about you, because you walk with the faith of Abraham. You see, Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 6, there's only one work that we can do to impress and please God. You know what it was? Believe. Believe him and trust him. He said that's the only work we can do is to trust him. That's the only thing that trusts God. You can't do this. And God says, wow, what a dancer. That really impresses me. That doesn't impress God. You know why? He gave you that talent. Although, I don't know, I think 46, he might, he might have gone, mm, wow, I gave her a little extra juice this week. Amen? You know? But you see, all our talents and cleverness doesn't, doesn't impress God. But the one thing that impresses God is faith. Let me tell you why. We can use our talents, but you see, faith is something that is not used. It's exercised. And God is impressed when his children exercise faith. When everything else looks like it has failed, they say, no, God, I believe you. God blesses people who believe him at his word. Amen? He blesses people. That's what he said he would do. He, he says, you're a special treasure to me. Wow, when I was born, my mother said, what a treasure. My father said, great, let's bury it. Right? Yeah. yeah. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Anyway, the Lord did not send his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. That means you weren't any more special. You weren't any more talented. In fact, look at what he goes on to say. This will really take the wind out of your sails. You were the least of all the peoples. Doesn't that make us all feel good? <laughs> God says, I've used the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Amen? And man, when he took me, did he take a fool? Be because the Lord loves you. Isn't that so cool? The Lord loves you. Understand, God... Love is not contingent upon our talents. It's not contingent upon our cleverness. His love's not even contingent upon our obedience. His love was contingent on the fact he created us and he has a desire and a plan for our lives. Oh, don't take me wrong. How many people know our attitude and behavior, can, we, we'll pay a price for that because God is holy and God can't coexist with sin, but God is on your side. He says today, you got it because I got you. From the beginning to the end, God has got us. And we can change that slide. Not only did God do it all, but I want you to know the reason you got it is because God's got your back. I love this picture of the father and the son with that bike. And uh, the reason I love that is the kid's riding right now going, I'm doing great, but he doesn't realize his father got ripped by the seat. Right? 
But don't tell me wrong, there'll be a day when that father can just let go of that seat and that boy's going to soar. And about 14 feet down the way, he's going to wipe out, of course, and cry, you know. But for that moment, he flew on that bike. You see, God's got our back. Look what he says here. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you walk uh, through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Wow. What incredible words. When you go through the water, I, I'm sure that, that Israel knew exactly what God was talking about. I'm sure in most of their minds, they must have gone back to the Red Sea. They must have gone back to when their backs were against the water and Pharaoh's armies were coming against them and, and they came and they had sword and, and, and they were ready to destroy them and God separated them with a pillar of fire, didn't he? That pillar of fire did not, did not hurt any of the Israelites. In fact, what happens is God parted the waters so that they could cross. The flames didn't scorch Israel. The waters did not drown Israel. Israel gets over, the waters close and the armies of Egypt are destroyed. See, God says, when you go through these things, I will be with you. Say that with me. I will be with you. You know what God's saying? You got it. You got it. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace? And they said, no, we're not going to turn back on the one true God. And we know that, that Nebuchadnezzar says, well, then I'm going to roast you in an oven. And they stick them in the oven. And guess what? They don't get scorched. They don't get burned. In fact, while they're in there, there's Jesus waving high. Amen? I want you to know, when, when you go through the furnace, it may be hot. When you go through the waters, it may come up to your neck. It might be scary. You may even take in a little water and cough and choke a little bit. But he says, you're not going to burn and you're not going to drown. The word there for burn is a really neat word. It's a word, it will, you will not be utterly consumed. It doesn't mean I won't feel burning, but it means I will not be consumed by that fire. Isn't that wonderful? God has got your back. You know, that's the problem many times, most of the time. It's not what life hands us. It's the crazy decision we make responding to life. Isn't that the truth? The, the panic decision. We heard of a horrible situation of someone, uh, a friend of Bill Cruz's, who made a panic decision this morning and took his own life, a father and a husband. For that, we have great mercy for a family asking God to move on this right now with his consolation. Amen? You know, the biggest thing is when, when, it, when you're all up in arms, you know what you should do? Nothing. Begin to pray. And even that's sometimes difficult to, difficult to do. But listen to me. When you're all crazy and nuts in your head, don't do anything. Don't respond. Don't, don't make decisions. Don't do anything. Just wait for the Holy Spirit of God to bring calmness to your soul. Amen? You know why? Because he's got us. He's got our backs. When you go through the waters, when you go through the fires, God is with you. In fact, it's more than just he's with us and he'll get us through. You see, if you go through the fire and God is with you, not only will he get you through the fire, but he'll refine you in the fire. How many people know that? Not only will he get you through the waters, he'll do more than that. He'll cleanse you through those waters. You see, what the devil means for bad, God means for good. Amen? What the devil intends to drown us with, God will cleanse us with. What the devil intends to consume us with, God will purify us with. God's got our back. Hey, Mountaintop Church, you got this. This thing called life, you got this. Because our Heavenly Father is looking out for us. Amen? Oh, please don't take me wrong. I'm not going to make it easy for a moment or make it sound like it's easy for a moment. It's not easy. How many people know it's not easy? You got your situations in life and I got my situations in life. We're a human being. We're all marred by sin. It's not easy. But listen to me. You got this. Because he's got you. He's got your back. Amen? If we could change that slide. Not only did God do it all from the beginning. Not only does God got our back. But the next thing he tells us, he brought us back. Remember we said, he said to Jacob, I created you. Then he says, I formed you. I redeemed you. In fact, maybe a word we should use is he reformed him. Amen? He reformed him. You see, everyone who's here in this place this morning, you were brought back. You, you were out somewhere else, and the, the devil had taken you out. But guess what? God brought you back. 
Look, look at this scripture. The scripture is so wonderful. For I am the Lord your God. When you see that, first of all, um, that word Lord, every, whenever you see Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's what we use the word Yahweh. We say the word Yahweh. You know, I always used to say this. I'm from Rahway, and I serve Yahweh. I mean, that's what I used to tell everyone all the time, right? I used to have some fun with some praise and worship albums. It would be at this point on the, on the altar, probably like, you know, uh, we won't talk about it. Anyway. For I am the Lord your God. Now, what's really important here, he says, the Holy One of Israel. If we could read this right, this is how it would go. For I am Yahweh. He's not saying, hello, I'm Matthew Jones. Hello, I'm the Lord your God. He's saying, I am Yahweh. He's self-existent. That's what it means. There is no God but him. He's the God of covenant that he made with him. And he says, I am, I exist. I, there, there's none other but me. And I'm that God of existence and covenant with you. See, God makes a big entrance here. Sometimes the way we translate it, it belittles a little bit. It's not God saying, hello, here I am, folks. Right? For I'm the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. The word kadosh, it means holy. I'm holy. I, 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 I'm above all else. I'm pure in heart. He says, I'm self-existent and I'm pure. Here I am. How many people you say, Lord, I need guidance right now, and all of a sudden you hear, here I am. I'm self-existent. I'm pure. And look what he says. You're what? Savior. Isn't this beautiful? You're Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom. Ethiopia and Sibia in your place. How many people know the firstborn of Egypt all died? You know why? God gave the firstborn of Egypt so that Israel could be set free. There's a type in that, that the firstborn would give their life. Huh? Ethiopia and Sibia were, were nations that ended up being conquered by Egypt instead of Israel. Since you were precious in my sight, God says, I am, I exist. He says, I'm holy and I'm pure. He says that I am your savior. He says, I've given a ransom in your place. And I love this. He says, I love you. I have loved you. Is there any better one you want on your side, someone who's all powerful, all loving, all kind, all pure? Do you, you want anyone else who's better on your side than God? You know, some of us might say, oh, my parents, they, they, they fouled up. Every parent fouled up. Get over it. Isn't that true? I'm not trying to be mean or anything like that. Please, I don't, I don't mean it that way. But listen to me. We have a better example. We have a better example of any parent. A better example of me. A better example of you. The great I am. Holy. Pure. The Savior of the world who has loved us with an everlasting love. He says, look at this. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. We know that the firstborn of Egypt died so they could be set free. But you know something? God sent a man for the, the sin of the entire world to give his life for all of us, that God would pay a ransom for all of us in Jesus Christ. I've redeemed you. Guess what? The Israelites were in Egypt and they were conquered. They were being annihilated. And God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to send one to deliver you. And we were in this world and we had been conquered by the enemy. And he said, no, no, no. I sent someone to deliver you. The great I am. Look what this goes on to say. Isn't it great that Jesus says before Abraham was, I am? You think he was just playing around with them? No, Jesus was speaking truth. Jesus wasn't mincing words. Jesus was speaking truth. He said, before Abraham was, I am. The same I am at the burning bush. The same I am in this passage. I exist. I am the self-existent God. He sent himself. He sent his own son. I will bring, look at this, I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. Not only did he redeem, he has gathered. That's why we're at Mountaintop Church today. If you weren't redeemed, you wouldn't be here today, would you? You'd be somewhere else. You see, God is in the midst right now of redeeming and gathering. That's what he is doing in this last day. Redeeming and gathering. He's redeeming his children and gathering them all together. And he goes on to say this. He, look what he says. I will say to the north, give them up. 
Did you ever think about that? We're worried about someone getting saved. We're worried about what the enemy's doing to someone. You know, our Father in heaven is saying, give them up. Now, who's going to say no to God? Give them up. Do not keep them back. My sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. You see, no one comes against the will of God. I want to ask you today, who is it that you're asking to get saved right now? You're asking God to move in their heart right now. I, I, I'll tell you what, your prayers mean everything because your prayers move the heart of God. Amen? And Christ, he came as, as our ransom, and he came for all of us, the self-existent God, that holy and pure God who's our Savior. And he says, you know something? Continue to pray because when I tell the enemy to give him up, that enemy has no choice but to give him up. You see, you got this because God's got you. Amen? You got this because God's got you. He's got your back, so don't worry about the situations you go and Trust him. But also, he's brought us back. He demonstrated his love by redeeming each and every one of us. We got this because God's already got us. We can change that slide. If we move on here, another great thing that we can be relieved by, he planned it way back. You see a little theme going on here, don't you? Should I go back? No, I'm just wondering. Okay. All right. One person got it. Thank you, Gladys, for laughing. It's, you know, it's all right. Everyone else, go home. Anyway. All right. So God planned it way back. Aren't you glad that God doesn't go, what am I going to do now? Aren't you glad God doesn't do that? Or are you worried that God does? Is God ever surprised? There's only one thing in Scripture that says that God marveled at. Marvel is not necessarily surprised, but it has that whole idea of, wow. You know what? I, I, we shared it with you before. You know the one thing that God goes, whoa, to? You know what he goes, whoa, to? Faith. When he sees someone exercise faith, he goes, whoa. Right? And I think he looks, he goes, you got it. You got that. Right? Everyone who's called by my name, whom I've created for my glory. We just talked about that, right? I have formed him. We just talked about that. I have made him. We talked about that. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. What's he talking about? Those who are blind and those who have deaf. He's given them new ears. He's given them new eyes. Those are the ones whom he's redeemed. Amen? Has God given you new ears and new eyes? Amen. We'll never see the world the same. We'll never see the kingdom the same. And let the people be assembled. Wow. Gathered together and assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say, it is truth. Wow. I love what it says. He gathers, then he assembles. Sounds like a model kit, doesn't it? <laughs> See, he gathers us all together. But then there's that whole idea of us assembling together. See, there's a difference. To gather means to take from all the different areas and bring to one place. Assemble means to organize. Understand, God has assembled us so that we may worship him. God has assembled us that we might serve him. You see, the gathering is not the completion of God's will. It's only the beginning. You know, when we were a couple years into Mountaintop Church, we, we, we had gone from just a handful of people, about a dozen people or, or less, and w within about a year and a half, we were running almost 100 people here. We were amazed by that, and we saw all these blessings, and someone paid to get a new parking lot, and, and then this grant came to do a new roof, and these things would miraculously happen, and we were like, this is amazing. And, and I remember it just it occurred to us at that time that we did not want to confuse God's blessings that were preparing us with the work that he had for us. Sometimes the bless me gets confused with the purpose itself. My purpose is not to be blessed. My purpose is to be a blessor. Now, don't take me wrong. God's purpose is to bless me. But my purpose is to take God's blessings and bless others. Is that the truth? See, because God planned it way back. That's how he planned it. That's how, how he wanted it to be. Look what he says in Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys know the scripture. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan for your life. Do you believe it today? You see, you got it today. You know why? Because God's got your back. God has brought you back. And God planned it from way back. 
God's got you covered. Do you believe that God's got you covered today? He's got you covered. You know, I'll never forget when uh, we found out Diane was pregnant from Matt. And uh, we saw the sonogram for the first time. Now, they've come a long way, sonograms. I mean, the amazing today, it's like, what we saw were little dots in the shape of a human being. Now today, they're like, mm, right? I mean, it's like amazing. They're waving at you and everything, you know? It's like, oh, come on, you know? Let's have a little something left to guess here, you know? But, but nevertheless, I just remember seeing that image of that little boy. And I got so welled up, and I, I began to cry within myself, dreaming of what God would do in his life. I, I didn't know what he would accomplish. I didn't know what my other children would accomplish. And still today, I don't know what they're going to accomplish. But I do know one thing. I wanted for them to know Jesus so bad. I wanted for them to be young people who grew up with great character. I wanted them to grow up with great joy in their lives. Understand, God feels the same way about you. He formed you. And he has that same heartfelt desire and love for you. The difference is, I don't know what my children's future is going to bring, but God knows what our future is going to bring. Amen? I do have plans for my family of where we'll go as, as a family spiritually and emotionally, but I don't have plans for other things because I don't know what the world's going to bring to us. But I do know my father's going to be with us. You see, I got it. You know why? Because he's got me. We got it because he's got us. He, he's got our back. He brought us back. He planned it from way back. Isn't that wonderful to know? He planned it from way back. And you can change that slide. You see, one of the reasons that God blesses us is so we could be a blessing. I sang that song last week, amen? Sorry about that. I didn't mean to break your eardrums. Anyway, look what he says here. You are my, what's that word? Witnesses. This is really cool. Now, I know in the New Testament it's the word martos, which means uh, literally a uh, martyr or witness, one who saw something. In the Hebrew, it's a little bit different. Get this. In the Hebrew, the base meaning is, get this, duplicators. Isn't that cool? Now, I, I think what that sort of means is if, 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 if Pastor Cody sees me do something completely ridiculous, you know, he'll go and tell someone and duplicate the situation so someone else can figure out what just happened. He'll, he'll explain it in a way that he's duplicated it to someone else, right? You see, God calls us to be duplicators, to give it back. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Do you think, for any, any, in any stretch of the imagination, that somehow God took you in by mistake? Do you think he came in with a few of the Syrian refugees by mistake? Do you think that, that somehow or another, that maybe God chose someone else, and I said, well, you're, you're with them too. Anyone ever see the League of Their Own? The only reason they took Kit was because they took their older sister, right? I took, we took you because we had to get your older sister, and she wouldn't come, so we took you. That's not how God works. How many people know that? You don't sneak in the kingdom of God. He doesn't take you secondarily so he can get someone else. God has a purpose and a plan and a love for you as an individual. You are part of this family. I want you to hear that with all your hearts today of how much this God loves you and that he has called you, he has purpose for you, and he says, I intend for you to be a duplicator for whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of God. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Wow. See, he wants us to come to the fullness of the understanding of who he is and share it with others. There are those people who say, yeah, I believe Jesus. I believe he's the son of God. And they think that they're going to go to heaven. People of false religions will say that, right? Many years ago, I was in New York and I got attacked by a guy. We were doing some uh, missionary work. And uh, this guy got a little aggravated because he saw me taking pictures. The missionary was taking. He goes, why'd you take my picture? And uh, he was, it was a Muslim fellow, and, and I was scared. He was like, well, when you're 5'5", when you're, five, five, you're afraid of everyone. You know what I'm saying? You know? and, and so anyway, what happened was he comes up to me, and he sees my camera. He points to it, and he sees the track that the missionary just gave him. And I'm like, oh, God. I'm like, what am I going to say? New York Times? <laughs> Uh, you know, Daily News. And he starts pushing me, and the guy behind me is pushing me back, and he's pushing me, he's pushing me back. I'm dead, I'm dead, right? And I didn't know what to do, and I thought all of a sudden I just said to myself, I'm going to die, I'm going to die for a cause, I'm going to die for Jesus. I said, do you know who Jesus Christ is? And he immediately stopped pushing me, and he said, he's the son of God. I said, do you believe it? 
And he goes, I don't know. He says, Allah's God, but maybe he's Allah's son. And we got in this conversation. Now, you got to know what happened. We got back and forth with this conversation. Before you know it, he's walking away from me. He's going, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about this. And I'm starting to follow him. Go, no, I want to tell you more about Jesus. And I'm saying, what am I doing? Right? Isn't it amazing how Jesus can turn a situation around? Yeah, praise God. Look at it. As newborn babes desire the pure milk, of the word. Why? That you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You see, my desire for my children was to nourish them and clothe them and nurture them and teach them until one day I could say, you got this. And God is the same way with you and me. He says, you know something? I want to feed you milk here. I want to, I want to nurture you, and, and I want to guide you, and I want to teach you that you may grow thereby. Amen? And the way we know it, we've tasted that the Lord is good. You see, that makes you a duplicator. It makes you a martos, a witness of God's goodness. Paul said this, all that I am, I am because of Jesus Christ. I was, he says, he was a, 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 an angry man, and he said he was a murderer, but he says all that I've become is because of Jesus Christ. See, Paul was the ultimate witness because he, all he did was proclaim what Christ had done in him. See, God wants us to grow. In that song last week that we sang, one of the lyrics said this. Uh, by the way, that was written by Scott Wesley Brown, who's gonna be here in two weeks, shameless plug. Anyway, I, I got to tell you how excited about having Scott Wesley Brown here. I know young people, you may say, who is Scott Wesley Brown? He's an old man, all right? But let me tell you something. I got saved on May 18th, 1984, and I was a very, very troubled young man. And I remember uh, I got saved, and about a day or two after that, someone gave me a Scott Wesley Brown album. He's made like 24, 25 albums, and they gave me a Keith Green album. And I heard this song called He Will Carry You. And I was going through the most difficult time of my life. And, and it gave me assurance that Jesus was there to carry me. And then he sang another song. It was called, When Answers Aren't Enough, There's Jesus. And I remember where I was going through. I, I, could, I didn't know the way out. And all I knew was that when answers weren't enough, Lord, I can come to you, Jesus. That man and his music changed my life. He's a piece of me. I'm excited for you to get a chance to meet him. Uh, he's a real neat guy. Um, what we talk, Oh, we're in a sermon right now. I forgot. Yeah. So... We give it back. He, he calls us to grow. He calls us to grow. He says, you got this. You know why? Because he did it all on the cross. You got this because he's got your back. You got this because he brought us back and he redeemed us. He says, you got this because he planned this thing way back. It was always part of his plan. He says, you got this. Give it back. Give it back. Be a duplicator. Do in others what I have done for you. And the last thing we're going to see this morning. And this is beautiful. There's no going back. You know, I don't think any of us can stuff our kids back inside of a, uh, our, ourselves, huh? Ain't gonna work. Sometimes I look at my kids and, Anthony, you're like, you're almost six foot, right? I mean, how, how tall are you now? Five what? Five ten, okay? And I look at Anthony, I look at my wife, and I go, didn't happen. It, it couldn't have. I mean, <laughs> Moms, you ever do that? You look at your kid and go, right? That's all right. My dad looked at me and scratched his head for different reasons, you know. <laughs> There's no going back. You know, it's funny. We grow up. We're out on our own. There's no going back. The only place I can go back is up here. And that kind of going back is wonderful because then I remember and I reminisce and I'm thankful and I remember the things that were said to me and the things I was encouraged by and it grows me, amen? But I can't go back to being a kid again. I can't go back to being immature again. I can't say, hey, I'm giving all this up. I don't want this kind of responsibility. I want to sleep till 11 o'clock in the morning again. Anyway. I was tempted. The devil came to me and I said, no. Look what this says here. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. You know what God's saying? I'm the one true God. There is no other God. 
So don't, he says this to his people, I believe, don't get any big ideas. Don't go chasing off of something. Don't pick up any wooden nickels, any wooden idols. They're not gonna do you any good, right? That's for certain. Oh, we can change that slide. Next, he says, I, even I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no savior. Wow. You know what that means? Only he can redeem. God's being real to the point and absolute right now, isn't he? You look to other things, you're not gonna find it. He goes on to say this in verse 12. I've declared and saved. I have proclaimed. And there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Now, hear me. It doesn't mean that Israel didn't have four gods among them that they had. They did. And do you think they worked? Israel always had foreign gods. They always had little idols they worshipped. And guess how much good they did them? They used them to cook their dinner after a while. Amen? Yeah. Because they did them no good. See, we learn. We have plenty of foreign gods among us, but we learn that there is no foreign god among us. Did you hear what I just said? See, we have all the things that we say are God. We have all the things that we think help us. We have all the things that we think are good for us. And then through life, we learn that there's none other but Jesus. He says, you learn that there's no other idol. There is no other foreign God but me. You are my duplicators. You are my witnesses. I love what he goes on to say here. Indeed, before the day was, I love this, I am. He was added. Before the day was, I am. What does that mean? Remember we said Yahweh? The, the Jews, in fact, the Jews don't pronounce it. They do something like, <laughs> remember Luke Costello whenever he got in trouble? <laughs> you guys remember that, right? It was like, <laughs> you guys remember that, right? That's sort of how you pronounce Yahweh in, 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 in Hebrew. You know, behold, Israel, <laughs> it's one, right? Because God is so holy, you can't pronounce his name, right? God is so holy, you can't pronounce his name. See, what the Jews did, they, they put something called a yud, which is like a y, hey, which is like an h, and then a, a yud, which is like another y, and a hey, which is like another h, and a yud, hey, vuv, hey, right? And, and v would be like a vuv, yud, hey, vuv, hey, and guess what? They said, that's Yahweh. And there's no vowels. There's no vowels, right? Now, if... The vowels were added, that's why we call it Yahweh today, or we call him Jehovah today, because they added vowels later on. But the Jews originally didn't put vowels there, it was just yud hey vuv hey. And when they saw those, those words, they went, <laughs> I hope when you see God, when you see him move, when you see him in his greatness, I, I pray that when God shows up, just like Moses at the burning bush, you're gonna go, <laughs> because he takes our breath away. Amen? There's no going back, amen? There's no going back. We've tasted that the Lord is good. I'm sorry, once you've had Coca-Cola, water's no good no more, amen? Once you've had steak, forget McDonald's, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? You see, We've experienced that he's good. He's the one true God. He, only he can redeem. He's demonstrated it so that we know there's no other God. We are his witnesses and his duplicators. I love this. God exceeds civilizations. God exceeds empires. God exceeds governments. They come, they go, and God just brushes them off his table. But he says, I'm forever. There's no going back. Look what Paul said in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. And today I'm telling you right now, he's saying, Rachel, you got this. And, and he, he, he's, you know, he's saying to all of us, Mia, you got this. Jesse, you got this. Maureen, you got this. Ruth, you got this. Hannah, well, maybe. Yeah, no, Hannah, you got this. <laughs> Vinny Baza, you got this. You got this. We got this, guys, because God has got us. Amen? 
Then why don't you come up as we close today on this Father's Day. I, I just want you to know that your heavenly Father, he loves you infinitely. Your heavenly Father, he says, you got it. You know why? Because he's got our back. He says, I've brought you back. Isn't that wonderful? He says, there's no going back. Understand, he says, I planned it way back. And he says, give it back. Share it with other people. On this Father's Day, if I could just relay one message, and I pray that it inspires you. That video so inspired me when I saw it the other day. As, as, as fathers, and especially as parents, as friends, as maybe even parents in Christ, the greatest thing that we could bring to someone else is to say to them, you got it.